friends. Welcome to Teacher Therapy. Today we have Mr. Peterson back by popular demand. A lot of you guys requested that he come back on. So we're just going to have him share some more stories, some things that he has had on his heart to share. So how are you doing over there, Mr. Peterson? Oh, doing well. Thank you. And thank you everyone else for your support and your thoughts. Fantastic. Well, let's kind of start on the whole topic of PBIS because that was a topic of my last video. And a lot of people just had questions and were genuinely surprised by how much schools have changed from the traditional model. So just to kind of define my terms, with the traditional model, we had detentions, in-school suspension. Sometimes we had things like community service. Other times, you know, there would be things like just like an office visit, but where the principal actually kind of scared you. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like a warm, fuzzy, like let's hug the principal, have Doritos with him, go for a walk around campus, have vacation, and then get sent back to class. That's kind of the new school model. So if you could just tell us, Mr. Peterson, how have things changed and what is the new school model of discipline look like? So yeah, so uh, PBIS, which means positive behavioral intervention something, I don't even know. Systems. <laughs> systems okay basically means that they're trying to develop a child you know it's particularly correct them uh with positive desirable outcomes only or positive desirable consequences which i mean it only takes any you know any half brain nitwit to realize that's not going to work because the when you're when you're teaching at a level higher than you know i would even say first second grade you know up to middle school and high school these are not toddlers that are going to get you know redirected with something that's shiny or sounds funny you know these are now you know students who are old enough that they're going to try to figure out how to navigate through a system in a way that positions them well to either get out of work or to do what they want to do or to antagonize somebody whatever right like it doesn't take a whole lot i remember myself being seven eight years old trying to think how can I get out of something you know how can I you know how can I abuse this situation to make things easier for me or whatnot so I mean obviously that system isn't going to work and yeah just a couple things that come up um, when they're talking about PBIS is one thing that I've heard a lot is the reasons uh, students act out is because they don't understand the expectations you know or you know they're over their they're in over their head or the pace is too quick or something like that and uh, that I can assure you right now the issue is not that they don't understand what's expected of them. The students on my campus that get sent to the office have heard what is, what is expected of them a dozen times or more. They, they know that they've had the discussion about how their choices affect their future. We're, we're now going to have to go past that stage. That's the very first level. And the office thinks that they're doing some kind of new groundbreaking you know, system, some kind of scheme by talking about their choices or telling them what's expected of them. And I'm like, okay, well, what did you think the teachers were doing on the first day of school? Or what did you think we did when they walk in you know, five minutes late and they don't have an excuse for being late. And then we have the, that, that discussion with them, the discussion that you're referring to when we talk about what's expected of them, you know, or the, the uh, impact that their choices will have on their future. That's the topic of conversation that t teachers have. So you're just reinventing the wheel over and over again and calling yourselves genius. So, yeah, just like the Bible says, you know, they profess themselves to be wise and they're fools. That's, that's one major issue that I've seen. And um, when it comes to, you know, another thing that really I, I just got very irritated with this this year with me, and I, I saw this happening a lot in the last couple of years, and I just thought maybe the office is too busy or I don't know what I was thinking. But I finally I finally kind of cornered one of our administration this year and I said, why are we not involved in this discipline process? Because I remember as a child, you know, if you got in trouble, in some way the teacher was involved. If they weren't actually in the room, you know, there was something that there was some report that they were sending to the office that we were discussing or something like that. But none of that happens anymore. In fact, they are actively trying to keep the teacher out of the disciplinary discussion. And the the administration says, well, you know, you're just you're just trying to be overbearing. You know, you're just trying to you're trying to get in here. You're trying to vent all your frustration. I said, no. I said, I. I, I want to be involved in this disciplinary process, not only because I want to see it carried out and followed through, but I want you to see me, how I'm talking to this child in here with all of us together. Don't you want to see that? 
<laughs> like, wouldn't it bring you comfort to know, to just tell yourself later on, like, yeah, Peterson's a straight shooter. You know, he's making sure that things are above board and you know, every, everything's on the straight and narrow in that room and we can feel safe and comforted knowing that all the students are in there, they're engaged, yada, yada, yada. This is his, you know, this is his mannerism when he's in the office dealing with the student. And I, you know, in turn took it a little further. And I said, look, I want you to see me the way that I'm dealing with this issue in here together but I'm also watching you. So I'm putting you on notice because I want to see what you guys are doing in here. And that is the real reason I think they don't want us in that room with them because they, they know that we're all going to be witnessing together, you know, how all this stuff is being taken care of. And he doesn't want me in the room or she, you know, depending on who your administrator is, they don't want me in the room watching them kowtow and capitulate to all these children, telling them things like, you know, oh, well, you know, you, why are you doing this? This isn't the way, this isn't the way that I know you, right? Or whatever they're saying. I'm like, I don't care how you know this child. I care about how I know this child because I'm the one dealing with the child in the room. They come to you here when they're contrite, you know, and when they're, when they're walking in, you know, playing their little violin for you and everything's turning out just fine for them because they know that you do sit in the position, you hold the office that can drop the hammer and they know that you won't. And it's really surprising to me that you can't, you know, you can't decipher this. You can't navigate through this problem. And so this, yeah, this positive behavioral intervention nonsense, it, I mean, <laughs> for anybody really, like, I, it's, oh, man, that's what's so surprising to me as well as a teacher is I'm like, I'm looking at these administrators and I'm like, you were in the classroom as well. How did you forget? <laughs> like, I guess, I mean, like just a couple years and you just totally forgot that you're not going to solve this problem, you know, by talking about their choices the entire year. You're going to actually have to hold them accountable at one point. And so, the, so they don't want you in the room, of course, when the child is being disciplined. And then, you know, there's no feedback. There's no results, you know, unless you pester them and you send them messages and you say, well, okay, what happened with this kid? And, then, you know, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 percent of the time I get a response on that. And um, they, they, they embark upon all of these super overly bureaucratic investigations to make it look like they're being thorough. But they're just wasting everyone's time. Like, <laughs> like, oh my God, the tardy policy at my, at, you know, my campus is like, okay, after a student is, you know, tardy like five times, and they can be referred to a counselor, and the counselor is going to talk about their choices, and then they, you know, they're going to come up with a plan, you know, to get them to show up on time. Which, by the way, you know, that plan is supposed to be just show up on time. But you know, I, I guess it's going to be something different. So then, you know, now the kid's back in your room, and then it, when that plan doesn't work they can be referred to a second appointment with the counselor and when, and they'll come up with a new plan. I, I wish I was lying about this. This is how crazy it is. So then after the second appointment with the counselor, then they're going to have a meeting with the parent. And it says actually in the words there, the teacher might be invited to this meeting. So now we're talking about like, I mean, who, who knows how long this could be a, a month, you know, after all of this, <laughs> after this defiance and rebellion is going on in class so it's a month later you're finally having a meeting with the parent and then after that meeting they make a new plan and when that doesn't work then finally at the very end there's a, a, a very small attempt at a uh, a punitive element where the student is not allowed to show up to dances or something and this is assuming in the first place that the student wants to be there it's like th th this god-awful overly bureaucratic process to produce nothing so all of this is stemming from this program, this PBIS program that, yeah, I, it just, it's not going to work. It's, that's the best way to say it. It's not going to work. You just brought back like all my PTSD memories. Of PTSD. I'm telling <laughs> right. you, you reminded me of this one little girl. We'll call her Malika. And this little girl would terrorize the classroom and she would have meltdowns and she would just throw a fit. And the mom wanted these really, really advanced special provisions made for her. So one of the things that was suggested to me for this little girl that was like terrorizing the classroom was you should make a calming station for her and give her an iPod where she can just calm down and soothe, have some coloring oh. books. This really safe space for her. 
And I'm thinking, okay, so the little girl's reward for terrorizing my classroom is like her own like vibing chill out space with like an iPod provided by the teacher. Like, are you kidding me? And this mom though was like so over the top. She basically said that her child had some like sensory discomfort. So she insisted that anytime the little girl had to like use the bathroom, she needed to have a 30 minute break so that she could go to the nurse and be able to remove all of the article of her clothing so she could make a bowel movement. I'm not making this up so that she would oh. not be uncomfortable in school. Oh, and I'm just thinking, okay, <laughs> at this point, like maybe you should homeschool your kid because nobody's yeah. got time for that. Like, no. And then my um, other, my worst year of teaching ever, this was my third year of teaching. These kids terrorized me. They were seventh and eighth graders. They basically wrote up a petition to get me fired and had a third of my students sign it by the third week of school, okay? These kids made up egregious rumors and lies about me, things that probably could have been like a court sentence or like something really seriously. They, they just made it up about me. They spread it to the parents and faculty and students and I should mention that this was a private school, so it was kind of a different atmosphere than normal schools. And essentially the whole time the administration knew that this happened, I had never found out about it. They never warned me. They never told me. And I found out about this from like an angry parent that was like, at least I didn't and like listed out all of these awful allegations. And I was just like, totally Holy shocked. Like, what? And so like I was in tears, I go to my admin and I'm like, this lady is saying that I did all these horrible things and like she's saying that all the moms know about this and just like, I'm a mess. And the admin's like, oh, we knew about that. And I'm like, you didn't think it'd be a good idea to like tell me? And she just basically was like, oh, well, you know, that's just a middle school beast, you know, kids will be kids. And I'm thinking like, these kids are trying to ruin my life. They're trying to get me fired. They're doing like, you know, writing up career ending rumors about me. Later on in the year, I found out that these kids were making memes about me and like spreading them all over social media. This was like in 2015 and 2016 when like social media started getting really popular with like the young yins. And I just remember constantly mm -hmm. going back to admin and saying like, what are you going to do about this? And just like what you described, they're like, oh, we're, we're handling it. We're dealing with it. Only to find out that they were actually like bringing in groups of students to ask them how they felt about me and how I could change my teaching. <laughs> and it was just, it was the, the inmates running the asylum. Like it was just so clear to me <laughs> that like basically the hierarchy was pretty much like parents, students, and like teachers on the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. And it was just like the same situation. I'm like, why don't we sit down together and tell these kids that this is not acceptable, that we will not tolerate teachers being harassed and bullied. And they're like, no, we don't really think that's a good idea. And I'm um, just like you said, I think for many of them, like they kind of get to hide cowardice behind pretending to do something while all the while they're actually just like buttering up these kids and their families full well knowing that these people can potentially destroy a teacher's life and they're just like not doing anything about it. So <laughs> that's just a little bit of like, you know, my teacher PTSD history. <laughs> wow. Man, yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that. I know, I, mean, I'm, I know. I'm Thank furious. you. I'm furious just listening to that. Like, I mean, yeah, if that, if that happened to me, I would just be a match in a cotton field. I mean, I would, I would just straight up tell I was like, you guys are going to be the most famous people in America tomorrow. Like, I was, <laughs> Yeah, I I will just I, I will just unleash the wrath of God upon you. <laughs> like, uh, that's yeah, so that's, good. That's... Like I'm just way too nice for my own good, apparently. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's really hard to like, you know, when you're in a situation like that, really figure out, you know, how to fix something like that. I and mean, there might not even be a way. It's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. Have you ever had like parents kind of like scheme against you or try to get you in trouble, like in your whole history of teaching? Yeah, uh, when I started teaching at a high school a number of years back there was a, a healthy amount of parents that for whatever reason weren't thrilled about me getting the job there and the school had i think kind of like a history of nepotism you know where you know certain people were only going to come in and teach there and i guess i i guess i was the unpopular one and yeah they behind my back not even knowing about it you know sending information to the school board and it was just like a constant battle and uh but nothing like what you mentioned <laughs> you know like it was uh 
it was just something I didn't realize that I was fighting against until it was over and then I was already gone anyway. But yeah, it does happen. Yeah, I think that most people wouldn't believe that sometimes like parents act as bad or worse than the kids. And then of course you wonder like, where are the students getting it from? Oh, mm -hmm. it's hard to get it from at home. Yeah, so, you, you, have you find out quick when you talk to somebody's parents, for sure. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, have you seen as an overall trend parents wanting to defend their students when you call home with a complaint? Yeah, I guess I would say about half and half. Okay. Uh, some parents that, um, you know, that are really supportive of teachers and then like, especially in smaller towns where everyone knows everyone's business, you know, the parents don't want that information getting out, you know, if they have a, you know, an honorable name or something. But yeah, I've had the other half where they, you know, they'll just go off on me on the phone and I've even had to say I was like look you got to compose yourself and we'll talk to each other later I'm not listening to this and then they're like I can't believe you would say that to me <laughs> you know <laughs> get all crazy on the phone and then, yeah so it's it's about half and half yeah, I think that's something that like so many people that are non-teachers don't realize the we're getting pressure from admin a lot of times we're getting pressure from parents we're getting tons of pushback from students and then at as a society, like a societal whole, there seems to be like a general disdain for teachers right now. And so it is just like such a demoralizing job. Um, is there anything about the job that is rewarding for you anymore? Like any like glimmer or shimmer of joy at all anymore? No, the, the magic is totally gone. I do have maybe students that I can count on one hand that show a lot of promise and talent you know, in the subject that I teach and I'll, you know, I'll make sure that they get the, t the attention that they need, you know, and they'll get a little extra, um, you know, extra resources or I'll take them to a level that's, that they're, that's higher than them, you know, so they can keep progressing. And then I'll, I'll work with the class on what the class is doing. And I kind of like put the, the gifted student, you know, in the corner and I say, they got it handled. They can do what they need. And I'll just raise your hand if you need anything from me, you know? And so, um, and it kind of sucks because there's so much more I could do with them, but yeah, <laughs> you can't. You gotta you gotta handle the rest of your class, but that's the only real kind of fulfillment that I get in my day at all. So when you think about the biggest problems that you have on a day-to-day -day basis, would you say that it's kind of like the jokesters causing distraction, or would you say it's a general apathy towards doing work and just feeling like you're kind of having to drag students along? The latter, I would say, is probably a bigger problem. The the jokesters com compound the issue because nothing's going to get done about that. So you have this issue where you're trying to drag things along and then it's also collapsing underneath your feet, you know, because the, the jokester is going to keep capitalizing off of that. And then the then it's a contagious of course you know so after by the time a month or two comes you know comes around the corner and now you've had one problem of a jokester making your life miserable and it turns into two and then four and then eight and so now you have half a class that is just yeah you know, making your time completely wasted mm -hmm. how do you feel about the recent push for technology in the classroom because i just feel like the last several years with just the push, at least in my districts, for every student to have an iPad or every student to have a Chromebook, I felt like half of my teaching time was trying to get them to stop FaceTiming each other and texting each other and like, I don't know, drawing like digital art. Like it was just maddening. Have you experienced that too? Yep. And it's a terrible, terrible idea. The The problem with all of this technology is it gives everyone the illusion that people are getting smarter. And all they're doing is getting better at using the iPad or getting better, you know, at interfacing their phone with whatever they're doing in class. And they're not getting smarter. They're actually getting dumber. <laughs> you know, like... Uh, it's an absolutely terrible, terrible idea. My own personal children do not use any of that stuff at home. If if there's ever a time that, you know, my children are on the computer, it's, you know, us doing something with them, you know, or if, I mean, we have one iPad here that is only for stuff that I use, you know, and like, you know, I don't know, accounts and things like that, that I use it for. And then there's, you know, one or two games on there that I'll let them play while I'm sitting next. And it's the same uh, it's the same thing that I think Steve Jobs would do or uh, Bill Gates say that their kids don't come anywhere near these devices. And it's like, well, that's why, because it's actually just uh, it's 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 the junk food. It's the sugar of anything intellectual where you, you just zone out and you're. Yeah, I mean, like, I've, man, like it's it's so it's such it 
it's such a waste. It's such a waste to see a whole class of kids and they're, they're, they're in the technology zone. You know, they're, they're doing their technology thing. Nothing is getting better. You know, like they're, they're not able to spell. They're not able to really process information. Uh, they think that, you know, typing something into Google is getting you the right answer. It's just, yeah, terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Does your phone, um, or sorry, does your school allow phones in the classroom? Unfortunately, Yes. Well, I, I think they leave it at the discretion of the teacher, which most of the faculty that I'm aware of allow it. And I just think that's insane. I, I No phone whatsoever in my room at all, ever. And the students hate me because of that. And I don't care. They're, you know, if I see, I, that's the rule in my room. There's signs all over the place. If I see your phone, you, even if I see it in your pocket, it goes to the office. And they hate it. They hate it. And I just, a student walks in, they got their phone in their hand. I'm like, yep, give me your phone. And they're like, oh, no, they're, you know, and they're, you know, raising hell about it. And I just say, yep, let me see that phone. Because it's gone, 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 gone. And then send it to the office. And there, you know, it gets gone for the rest of the day. And the, yeah, but what wouldn't you know? You walk into my class every day and every student, you know, for the most part is engaged and involved and they're doing what they should be doing. And that, that headache of texting each other in class or doing whatever I, I mean I, i've been walking around campus and i you know i look into other rooms there's kids with their hoods over their heads sitting on a desk everyone's on their phone teachers up in the front of the room teaching and it's just it's it's, it's chaos it's, it's just no way there's no way you could possibly achieve anything you know impressive or remarkable in a room like that definitely yeah I remember one of my districts, especially when they were pushing, you know, 2020 and beyond, just the real push for technology. They're like, oh, if they're, you know, if your student leaves their iPad behind, you know, or at home, they can just use their cell phone. And I've even heard in other neighboring districts that students were essentially allowed to record the teacher on their cell phone, mm. which is bananas like i just well, i don't get it i don't get it at all so let's well, uh, you're, let's... you're in a staff meeting you know and everyone's this is ever since i've been teaching you know there's always been some new technological thing that's been a, a problem you know so ever since i've been teaching the phone has been the main one and you always get some brilliant teacher or faculty member or administrator saying these exact words well maybe it's in time that we quote unquote embrace the technology that's the word they always use so let's, let's embrace the technology and i'm like you're just walking into your own destruction it's totally unnecessary <laughs> you know what you need to worry about is reading writing arithmetic that's what you that's what the kids need to do like okay another example my own children right i, I actually teach my children all the stuff that we do in math is on an abacus an old school abacus <laughs> you know where you have to actually literally move the beads and they can process so much faster than any other student that i've seen at their level you know oh and they're like well i can't believe you don't let them use a the calculator i was like they know how to use a calculator right they're, they figured that out in about 45 seconds but the abacus where you actually see all the beads moving and then boom, 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 you give the answer right away. I mean, like the, the technology is nice and there are definitely uses for it, but I mean, it's 90, 99% of the time in school, it's unnecessary. In fact, it works against us. Definitely. You just reminded me of a conversation that we tried to have with admin one time and we were just all discussing how completely impossible it is for us to like keep control of what students were doing on the iPads. And we were asking like, is there more ways that we can lock them down? Is there certain programs that, we're get, that we could get so that students can't access these other sites? And the district level high administrator literally looked at us and said, oh, we need to teach kids digital citizenship. And if we lock things down, then how are they gonna learn how to have digital citizenship? And we're just all, staring uh, at this person like idiot. do you really believe what you're saying right now it's just it's just bananas so let's pretend that we have somebody that's not a teacher in the audience and they just want like a story or a vignette or something what are some of the frustrating things that just go on in the school building what kind of like stories can you can you tell us today okay well i'll start with i'll start with the faculty so you know we're we're in faculty meetings and the content of the information, you know, the, the actual stuff that we're going over in a meeting, I really do honestly feel that I'm just kind of like sitting in a third grade classroom and I'm a third grader in this classroom. Like the stuff they're covering is are things that by all means are, are well known and more by any educated 
functional college student, right? Like we're all at that level now. And they're, they're talking about things like, um, you know, the way to communicate with people. And, you know, if someone says this and, you know, it's not okay to say this, this, and this, and you should say this, this, and this. And it's, it's just, it's total waste of time. Like there's actually no information going on in faculty meetings that has to do with issues going on on the campus. You know, things that any any adult would actually want to participate in. Like we're just we're just sitting there, and I actually calculated it one time in a meeting. I you know there were I don't know 40, 50 some odd pe- people in the room. You know, and I just kind of took a kind of ballpark guess of an average salary for you know the the teachers in the room and the administrators and everything and the hour and a half that we were in there literally cost the community around us something like four and a half thousand dollars like four four or five thousand dollars just for us to sit in there and we were talking about a feather or something you know like it's just total waste of time and so that's something i think the community would want to know about um another story well, here's here's just another example from the meeting. Okay, so they're trying to they're having this horrible tardy issue, you know, on campus, and they're saying, well, the reason why students are tardy is because um, we're we're not doing a good enough job of convincing the students that the time is valuable, you know, in those first couple minutes of class. If the students think that that time is valuable, they're going to show up on time, and so they're like, so you know, just. Just make a little three minute, four minute, you know, like little pre lesson that has a lot of jokes, you know, or interpretive dance or some kind of, you know, acrobatic, like whatever, right at the front of the room that makes them want to be there. So, so just do that real quick. You know, you you have you have six classes times 180 days, so it's it's just a little over a thousand little mini lessons. Just do just do that real quick. And I'm like, you know, okay. So, and it says literally on the top of the page, you know, the 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 key to an effective tardy policy is making the students uh, understand how the time is valuable. And I'm like, no, the key to an effective tardy policy is accountability. You know, just like what you make all of us do if we don't show up on time. You know, we didn't all come to this meeting because we thought the first three minutes was going to be as valuable as the rest of the time or valuable at all you know, for the whole meeting. We're here because it's expected of us, because that's part of the contract. That's part of the agreement. That's how you function as an adult in life. That's what the students need to realize. And I, you know, I've made this clear one time. I said, look, this, the reason why the, the, the first couple minutes of class is valuable is not because I do some kind of interpretive dance or some kind of acrobatic display in the front of the room. The reason why the class is valuable is because it's my time. That's why, that's what the students need to know. That's the essence of the educational model is the fact that some, theoretically speaking, a student will enroll in a class with the understanding that I don't know this information and that guy up there does. So that's why I need to be here on time because if I'm not here on time, I'm not going to learn whatever, you know, I'm not going to get the, as administrators love to say, the instructional time that I need. Right. So that's the only, that's as far as the argument goes. And that's the only thing the student needs to know. That's the only thing the adult needs to know is that it's my time. And that when the, when, when the witching hour comes, it's, it's showtime, it's business. And, and when that, you know, when the bell rings, I don't give the class a three minute cushion, you know, to get there. They get a one second cushion. As long as it takes for that bell to ring, that's as much time as you have. That's your, that's your window of opportunity to be here on time. And so that's, that's a lot of the stuff that they talk about in staff meetings is they gas, they'll, they'll gaslight this concept and turn it into a whole 45, 50 minute session about how you can make your, you know, first three minutes, you more valuable to the students. Like, um, yeah, like sort of what you touched on earlier about the you know, all all of the waste or all of the the extra unnecessary work or effort that goes into this stuff. It reminds me of a Frasier episode where he has a cricket in his apartment, you know, and he's spending his whole time during this episode trying to catch this cricket, and finally comes to the realization that he just needs to get an apartment for himself and an apartment for his cricket, and that's <laughs> that's the efficiency, you know, of the, of the public school model is that. Well, that's just all we got. Like my my buddy who's a teacher thought of the same thought of something similar where he said, you know, we go to these staff meetings and they spend so much time 
talking about how they're going to raise up a couple points on some very isolated, specific demographic that no one's talking about the gaping hole in the side of your ship. We'll get together and for hours and hours talk about the most effective means of bailing out water. You know, these buckets work better than the buckets we're using now. So we're going to learn how to use these buckets, you know, so we can bail out this water. But don't mention the giant gaping hole in the side of our ship. And I think the community would like to know that. Now, when it comes to the students and, and stop me if you need me to stop. No, you're good. Okay. So uh, just another story on the students. So like, um, you know, before, we, uh, I think it was our, our conversation before we were talking about how the students really think they have a lot more power than they really do, or they think that their, that their position is much higher than what it really is. And, you know, they'll, they'll say to you all the time, like, I don't even want to be in this class or something like that. And it turns into an argument or some kind of display of challenging your authority or whatnot in the room. And, you know, finally, I just said, look, you know that no one's asking if you want to be in this class, right? No one asked you and no one's going to. No one's asking me if I want you in the class. We're just stuck together. I'm stuck with you and you're stuck with me. You know, and I'm like, I don't mean this to try to be a jerk. I'm just saying that's that's the reality. Like, and for some students, it finally hits them. They're like, yeah, you know what? No one did ask me <laughs> if I want to be in this class. I'm like, so just stop saying that in class because the, the question was never poised to you. I'm so glad that you brought up so many of these topics because just so many memories are coming back to my mind. When you were talking about the faculty meeting, I remember just a couple where we like kind of tried to push things. And one of them was the fact that basically we were having most of our student body anywhere between one to three years behind. And I don't know about how your school district does it, but they were very much like, we need to stay on the curriculum. We can't get a day, a, a day off of the curriculum. And we're basically saying, you know, like if you were to use the topic of math, for example, they're, we're thinking they can't learn algebra because they still don't know how to multiply and divide. We need time to fill in those skills. And it was just fascinating to watch the administrators essentially say, oh, they don't need those skills just teaching algebra. And it was just like, no, it doesn't work that way. And it's just, it's almost weird. It's almost like they don't have critical thinking skills sometimes. It's very bizarre. And then on that same vein, I remember another yeah. time where it was a year where there was a ton of student misbehavior and student and teachers were genuinely trying to talk to the administrators and say, we really need support. We need behavior programs. We need something to happen because we can't even get through any of the lessons because there's so many interruptions and there's so many issues. And basically the administrators would just completely, like you said, gaslight us and say, if you were more interesting, if you were more entertaining, if you made the students more invested, if you built more relationships, then you wouldn't be having any of these problems. And so it's just this awful cycle basically of it's all the teacher's fault. Students have no accountability, no responsibility. It's almost like they come as, I guess, a blank lump of clay. <laughs> and we're supposed to just magically mold them into these academic scholars and stellar citizens with no cooperation at all on their part. And I think that that's what so many people don't realize that teachers are up against these days. And everything you were saying just really made me think about the entitlement that's being bred in students. Because when they get to actual college, they're gonna have boring textbooks. They're gonna have boring teachers that lecture. They're gonna need to have an attention span to actually listen. And everything's not going to be so customizable where they have five different options for their assignments. And normally, although I'm hearing from college professors that they're getting the same pressure in academia, but normally deadlines aren't flexible. And so do you have that problem in your school district? Are they kind of pushing the like, let them turn in stuff whenever kind of thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And especially like you mentioned, the uh, this unhealthy obsession with making learning fun or, you know, as I was explaining to one of my administrators that uh, every adult is going to learn quite abruptly when you get into the workforce that for the majority of your functional adult life, you're going to be sitting in a room and there's going to be someone in front of the room dishing out instructions or just information. And it's up to you how to absorb it and retain it. They're not interested in all in your learning style. They're not interested in all in repeating themselves or coming up with four or five different ways of getting the point across. When you're in a business, the person in charge of that business is gonna be giving you information and you're gonna be taking it and that's the way it works. And it's dull and it's boring and it's dull and it's boring because it works so well. 
<laughs> you know, like the, the, the meetings where you get the most stuff done is the, the dullest meetings on the face of the planet where you have usually like Robert's rules of order, you know, very systematic and very organized. And nobody wants to be in these things because it's it's just really hard to sit through them. But there's no denying that's where most stuff gets done. And for most of your life, the information you, you will be receiving will be in what essentially is a lecture format. And it's because any you know, any boss or anybody running an organization that's doing it successfully is doing it because it's, it's, it's being done efficiently. And it's not going to be, quote unquote, fun. It's going to be work. You know, it's, you have to have mental discipline to sit there and be able to take that amount of information for most of the rest of your life. And, and be, so you really ask the question, well, what, what, what did people think school was for? Like, you know, maybe all the way back to first and second grade, you know, you introduce this concept in maybe five to 10 minute spurts. And by the time you're in middle school and high school, it's 45 minutes to an hour long. And when you get into the workforce, you're going to be sitting in meetings for hours sometimes. And you just got to make it work. And so this unhealthy obsession with making learning fun has morphed into this, just this crazy program where, you know, now... Uh, I remember when I was in the credential program, they were trying to convince me that, you know, all these students had different learning styles and some students learn visually and some students learn audibly and some students learn with motion and some, some students learn if you do it in interpretive dance or whatever. And I'm just like, that's insane. <laughs> like, it's insane to think that you're going to take a lesson and do it seven or eight times in seven different ways, which is like, well, no, you don't do it that way. You just, do, you just incorporate all of those into your lesson. I'm like, well, then fine. Then you get one seventh, you know, of like one student's going to get one seventh of the stuff that you're talking about because then you're going to spend the rest of your time doing learning styles that isn't their learning style. So what's your plan, genius? <laughs> like, well, how are we going to do? We're going to pull this up. And... Yeah. You just reminded me just of the fact of how absurd this is. And I think that this might be like a Western world problem because you go to other countries in Asia and Africa and those teachers aren't doing interpretive acrobatics with like bubble artwork they're in rows in a chair the students are quiet and listening even at really young ages and that's the expectation and kids meet the expectations yep. and isn't it interesting that america is falling so behind on all of these standardized tests and all of these skills because we have a culture problem and Something that annoys me personally is that yep. a lot of people think like these are like only inner city problems or only problems with like black students, for example. I get those kind of comments all the time. But even when I worked in a private school with, you know, 99% wealthy Caucasian kids, we were having a lot of these same issues, honestly. Yep. I will say culturally, there was more pressure from the parents since they were paying $1,000 a month of tuition, you know, for teachers to give the students A's. And maybe some of the teachers, you know, um, noticed that the kids were really learning the content. <laughs> There was like a lot of pressure, you know, like you better give this kid an A. And sometimes the kids were like putting in the work and sometimes they weren't. But I think like no matter the race or the socioeconomic status, like we have a Western world cultural problem of laziness, apathy, a lack of respect, and this just enormous entitlement thinking that everything should be fun and feel good and be customizable and be flexible and be up for negotiation. And I'm hearing from like literally every sector from like people that manage McDonald's to people in the military, like they write me and they tell me like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing these same issues with Gen Z. Like they cannot take commands. They cannot take orders. They want to, they're basically everybody mm -hmm. like from Gen Z, it feels like is walking into places and thinking that they can set the rules, the tone, the standards, and people just don't realize, and their parents are supporting them, but people don't realize that it's impossible for one teacher to follow the customizations of 25 people in any context. Like as soon as you say like, okay, like you were saying, these kids want interpretive dance and you're going to have another section of the class that's saying like, no, I need a visual lingu linguistic representation. It just, it gets bananas really fast. And at the end of the day, what I'm just noticing again and again is the shift of accountability is off the students. Like that's just always what it turns out somehow, like students are getting taught to kind of claim victim status over everything. And again, it's not just, you know, mm -hmm 
socioeconomic students of color, sometimes if you go into richer, you know, communities, the uh, the entitlement and the rich kid attitudes are like 50 times worse because then they have like Karen mom supporting them. So I just like to like throw out mm-hmm. public announcements because I get tons of comments like, oh, it's so much better in private school. But like I said, you know, my year in private school pretty much gave me PTSD. It was so bad. The kids were so awful. And so I just think we have like a really serious cultural problem. I think it comes from the movies, the Netflix shows, the songs, the entertainment, and the lack of parenting. And I feel like schools are just like in this awkward position of trying to please everybody and it's impossible. And that's why I like the education system is burning down. So that's my little rant for the moment. <laughs> I'll let you share your thoughts on that. Amen to that. And <laughs> even if there was some kind of freak teacher that could customize a lesson for 25 kids every day for 180 straight days, the simple question is in what industry does that happen in real life? What would be the point, even if you could pull it off? <laughs> like there's, there's no one, no one in business, no one in military, no one in sports that's going to customize like that it mm-hmm. simply won't happen especially if you're you know if your um, product is team based it's just not going to happen <laughs> and so it's it's it, it is a um, it's a campaign and a program that is trying to be placed on teachers so someone can try to say that they came up with the new groundbreaking information or, and it's not going to work it's you you're not going to beat the old school you know there's nothing like the old school and you try anything else you're just an old fool (laughs) i like that i like it so have you ever had a scenario where you did have really great administrative support and if so what kind of difference did that make for you the one that i can think of was actually was at the the high school that i taught at where i was having some some trouble with the parents but uh the high school principal was a pretty hard-nosed you know, very, very strict on discipline principle. And if I'm not mistaken, he was like some naval officer or something, you know, in, in years prior, you know, so he was very you know, regimented. He was like, the, the message was abundantly clear on campus that he is not going to tolerate uh, any kind of misbehavior or, um, uh, you know, defiance or disrespect from student to student or student to teacher or teacher to student or teacher to teacher. It was very clear that was not going to happen. And I remember there was once or twice, I mean, and by the way, everyone, like in case it ever came across that I'm on, I'm in some holier than thou position that I haven't made any mistakes. No, I have made plenty, you know, I've made some very bad mistakes before. And, you know, at this high school was a couple of those and I had to make the walk to the office and I knew it was not going to be good when I go in there and it was not going to feel good exiting there, you know, and, but you know at the same time he also was like a mentor you know and he would you know he would do what he could you know to correct you and i mean it wasn't like a yeah it wasn't like a overbearing authoritarian kind of a guy you know but it was just very clear and i i made that i told that to my administrators this year i said the the clear message that i'm getting from this office this year is not that you're it is is not what I saw at this other school, you know, where, where we don't tolerate disrespect and we don't tolerate defiance. The clear message that I'm getting from this campus is just endure it for a little while. And when we say a little while, it means forever, you know, just, just take it. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, you know, and if you want, if you ever want a different narrative to start believing, you're going to have to lay, the, lay down the law. You just, um, ironically enough at that high school with that principal, as much as I respected it, we didn't actually get along very well. You know, I mean, we, it was professional and we had a, you know, we had a working relationship, but, um, yeah, I definitely respected the way that he kept that school under control mm-hmm. as far as I knew, you know, I'm sure there's probably plenty of things I don't know, but from my experience there, it went pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I've had a few admins write me because I always feel bad a little bit. I feel like, you know, it sounds like we're always throwing admin under the bus. But a lot of them have kind of let me know, like, look, we're actually like we're on your side. It's actually like the school district that's breathing down our neck. Like one wrote me recently and basically said, essentially, like we try to do the write ups and then the district tells us to like delete them and to stop taking them. So it just seems kind of like a no win situation. But I think most teachers would say like, even if the principals could be honest and say, you know what, we don't 
necessarily agree with this, but this is what we have to do and why. And we believe what you're saying and we affirm your experience. But instead, like you mentioned, oftentimes, unfortunately, because they're having to kind of cover their own self, there's just a lot of the gaslighting and the making us feel like we're imagining everything and that we're all crazy collectively. So I just think for, I think administrators can have a make it or break it role in a school. Um, but a lot of the ones that I've known, like they end up actually getting incredibly sick because it's just like they're under so much stress. So I, I always wish that I had like more of an encouraging <laughs> report about like the state of education, but I kind of am at a loss for what could happen as long as our culture and our society has the values that it does. It's just bleeding into the schools and all the pressure is being put on the schools. Yeah, I tell people every day, the one of the most poisonous influences on a child is public school. Yeah, and they're like, well, how could you say that? You work in public school. I'm like, well, then I think you should listen to me, <laughs> you know, because I'm in there. And that's what I know. It's at, I mean, from the administration, from the faculty, from the, the other students that are going to be around. Yeah, it's absolutely one of the most poisonous influences. Now, when you were talking about you know, administrators claiming that they have their hands tied behind their back. I actually brought this up with one of them. And I said, look, if, if that's the case, you know, because he was really offended one time that I wrote a letter saying, look, if, if you're having, if you're getting pressure from on top to stop doing the things that you want to do, you know, should I go and talk to these people? And he thought he considered that a threat. I'm like, no, what I'm saying is if, if what you want to do is to actually support the faculty and, and get the message out that you're not going to tolerate this and you're being told that you can't or you're getting pressure to do the opposite, then I will lock arms with you and go to battle because this is a very important issue for me. And so uh, and when you when you say these things, you can kind of see them somewhat him and ha, you know, like, OK, well, yeah, like, yeah, this is also kind of my vision as well. And I'm like, OK, well, now we're getting somewhere. Now I know that you're part of the problem. And so, yeah, now I am going to go to battle with you, not not alongside you, but I'm going to battle with you. Yeah, I, I am not the cannon fodder during this experiment for you, where you, know, you guys are going to try this out for a year or two or however long you're planning, and I'm just going to be stuck in there enduring it this whole time. Like, you know, I'm, like me personally, I've been working on my, you know, my discipline, my craft, you know, the subject that I teach for longer than some of the teachers on this campus have been alive. I'm just, yeah, I, I am, I am totally fed up and I'm not dealing with this anymore. I'm, I'm way past this level. <laughs> you know, I'm not just some spring chicken straight out of the credential program. That's going to be compliant because you guys, you know, want to, want to gaslight me into, you, you, into the stress that we're, I'm going to be dealing with and just telling me to kind of deal with it. No, I'm, 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 I'm not the guy, I'm not the order following compliant, willing participant in this experiment. So, Absolutely. yeah. Well, this has been a super interesting chat. I want to let my audience in yeah. on a little bit of a secret. We have a podcast episode that we actually couldn't put on this platform because of the topic discussed. So I want to encourage you to check out my Spotify podcast called Teacher Therapy for an uncut, unedited conversation that I think you guys are gonna find really interesting. So as always, we thank you guys for watching. We thank Mr. Peterson for being here. If you ever have any questions for him, go ahead and type them in the comments, any video ideas for the future. But we thank you so much, Mr. Peterson, for being with us. Is there anything you wanted to close us out with today? Uh, no, thank you very much. All right, sounds good. Bye, everybody.